Well, good morning, uh, Mr. Secretary, and thank you for joining us today, and thank you all uh, for joining us here in the meeting this morning. Pleasure. Um, we're here to talk about an important issue of social determinants, uh, and m but most importantly, how it relates to housing. You've had a very interesting life, uh, starting, I'll call it as a boy wonder in Detroit, and taking you to Yale, then to Michigan Medical School, and then at age 33, being the youngest uh, chief pediatric neurosurgeon. In looking at those experiences that you had, uh, how would you say your experience, if we start with it being a neurosurgeon, mm -hmm. uh, impacts your ability and opportunities at, at HUD? Uh, well, you know, you learn a lot of things uh, in the field of medicine, and particularly in, uh, in neurosurgery, and uh, particularly in the academic setting. One of the very important things is learning how to use information, to use data and evidence in order to make decisions, and that's key. And that means a lot in the world of science, not so much in the world of politics, but uh, a lot in the world of science. And um, you also learn to be courageous, because uh, you know I had a fair amount of controversy in my medical career because I liked to push the envelope. You know, if things weren't exactly right, why not look for a better way to do it? And uh, you know, some people think that's being a hot dog when you go off and <laughs> do something. But uh, so you learn to sort of put all of that in the background and just focus on what you're doing. And uh, you know, many of the things that I was criticized for at some point are now standard practice. Um, but perhaps the most important thing is, as a pediatric neurosurgeon, I would frequently spend hours and hours, sometimes operating all night long, to try to give a little baby a second chance at life. And most of the time we were successful, only to find myself a few days later in a terrible dilemma. Because now, I frequently had to send them back into a horrible environment with rats and roaches and mold and lead and violence, and you just didn't want to do it. Sometimes I would order extra tests so they could stay in the hospital an extra day. Don't tell anybody. How would that work but, uh, today? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now, you know, I'm privileged to lead an agency that can actually do something about that. Well, thank you. I, so you have now been in government for about uh, two years, 18 months. Mm -hmm. How have you enjoyed that experience and the transition from being actively involved in the medical profession every day? Uh, enjoyment might not be the right word. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it has been interesting. Uh, let me put it that way. You know, I'm an anti-bureaucrat. Um, you know, I don't like bureaucrats because bureaucrats are people who think that the rules are more important than the goals. And surgeons have a tendency to just want to get it done. You know, when in doubt, cut it out. You know, so, uh, you know, there's, there's real tension there. But uh, it's been a very good transition, actually, because uh, one of the things that surprised me the most is I was told, you know, coming in, you'd have a lot of career people, and they'd be all trying to torpedo everything that you're doing. I've not found that to be the case at all. You know, particularly recognizing them as sources of tremendous information. Many have been around for 10, 20, 30, 40. Some will admit even longer than that, uh, periods of time, and really have a lot of in-depth knowledge and historical knowledge, which is very helpful in helping to put some of the policies together. And then I've been blessed with a, a, a number of people around me who have accomplished a lot in life, maybe not in the area of housing, but in other areas, uh, have become very successful, and instead of just retiring, have decided they want to give back. And then we have many people who, in that same category who uh, have a lot of experience in housing. So a combination of all those people together recognizing what the real goal here is, which is not so much just putting people under a roof, 
but really getting people out of poverty. That's, that's really the main reason that I'm here. Recognizing that there are some people who are elderly, who are disabled, you know, we just need to take care of those people. We have an obligation as a society to do that. But there are a lot of people who are work-able people who've sort of given up and just uh, don't really see themselves as, you know, part of the American dream. Uh, we need to re-establish that dream for them. And not just tell them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps, but give them some bootstraps mm -hmm. and a ladder and a push. And what would that look like? Well, it, it looks like uh, probably a good example. Uh, there's something we call the HUD Bash program, uh, where we deal with homelessness amongst the veteran population. You know, one percent of our population protects the other ninety-nine percent of us. We really have an obligation to take care of them, and yet there were a lot of homeless vets. So uh, HUD provides the housing voucher and the VA provides the wraparound services. If you give them just housing, it doesn't work. If you give them just wraparound services, it doesn't work. But when you put them both together, uh, since 2010, the number of homeless vets has been reduced by 50% and continues to go down, uh, with many uh, cities proclaiming an end to homelessness on a regular basis, 66 of them now. So. Uh, that's the same concept, providing people not only housing, but the kind of wraparound services that empower them uh, educationally, economically, character and leadership, health and wellness, all of those things together are, are really what can propel a person in their society. Well, thank you. If, if we look at, at housing then as the foundation for health, as a, a, or a critical piece of that foundation. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, and we look at the res, a lot of the research that would show the, the linkage between uh, neighborhoods and health outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what are the next steps we need to be taking in, in, the, in the communities mm -hmm. to, to help improve the health of the individual in those communities? Yeah, well, you know, most people spend about 70% of their time in their house. So obviously, if that's a healthy environment, you know, that's going to be helpful to them both in terms of their physical and mental health. And particularly when we're talking about young people. You know, my whole professional career has been focused on young people. And uh, exposure to lead. And by the way, this happens to be a National Lead Prevention Week that we're in from 21st to the 27th, so it's a good time to be talking about Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Um, you know, the exposure uh, can really damage the developing brain. And we're not just talking about short-term consequences here. We're talking about lifetime potential. And you're also talking about the loss of human potential. And you're talking about humongous medical costs. So, you know, it is really incumbent on, on us as a society that wants to be fiscally responsible, you know, to deal with lead hazard uh, uh, conditions. You know, since 1978, it's been illegal to use lead-based paints. But think about all the habitations that were formed before that time. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you look at the ones that don't have any type of government oversight. You know, nobody's doing the remediation in those situations. I did last week uh, speak to about uh, 200 uh, pastors and community leaders to talk about maybe them adopting a block and just saying this will be our church pro project to remediate this block in terms of lead. But also, you know, you look at things like mold and uh, the tremendous amount uh, of resources that we spend each year on asthma. Uh, you know, we need to be dealing with the mold prevention and, and preventive measures are what we really are starting to concentrate on now. You know, what kind of, of building materials tend to be mold resistant? Uh, because we know we're going to continue to have uh, moisture issues, we're going to continue to have natural disasters, things like that that bring about these conditions. 
So why don't we start thinking more about the kind of materials that we use and, and how we can print? Because it, again, we're looking at the long term and, and that's the thing that's gonna help to save us financially. You know, we're in a situation, uh, I hate to bring up finances, but you have to be realistic. You know, $21 trillion national debt and it continues to be a problem. Uh, probably not a problem for me or you, because we're going to be dead. But a Gee, real thanks. Real <laughs> <laughs> but okay. <laughs> a real big problem for our children, for our grandchildren. Uh, and in fact, if we continue to accumulate debt at the rate that we're doing, going right now by the year uh, 2048, which is only 30 years from now, every penny the government takes in will be used to service the debt. You know, that's unsustainable. And, you know, I know we kind of live in a society now where we say, well, let's just deal with today and let's not worry about tomorrow. But it wasn't always like that in our country. Thomas Jefferson said it's immoral to steal from the next generation. He would have a stroke if he were here today. And uh, so, you know, we do have to, to deal with those kinds of things as we think about uh, you know, how do we treat the various problems, the, the health problems. And also, uh, getting back to the home, let me go to the other uh, extreme, the elderly. We spend $66 billion a year on injuries to people who've fallen in their homes. You know, we need to deal with those kinds of issues too. So when we're talking about creating safe environments, we're not just talking about mold and lead. We're talking about retrofitting or when we build things, build them in a way that uh, includes safety because we have to recognize that our population is aging. It's the fastest growing demographic is aging portion of our population. So if you, if you go back to Detroit again, okay, um, earlier this year you came up with a program, a pilot I believe, called Envision. Uh, that has uh, gotten some press and, and, and some comments on it, but I'd like for you to share a little bit what was behind it, what do you want to accomplish by sure. it, and uh, okay. you know, what can we expect? Yes. Well, you know, it comes from the Bible. Uh, Proverbs 29:18. it says, Without a vision, the people perish. And we had a lot of people perishing and a lot of people who don't have a vision or they just don't see beyond where they are right now. You know, it was Helen Keller who said, I would rather be without sight than without vision. And you just think about that. And uh, people who've quite, kind of zoned out and they're just happy to be maintained. And, uh, you know, that's really not what America uh, has been about or should be about. So with the Envision Centers, we, first we started calling them Vision Centers, but we figured everybody would think they were going to get glasses, so, so now we call them Envision Centers. But uh, the concept is we take uh, all 23 uh, federal agencies, uh, state and local, take resources from all of those, because they almost all have something that's focused on self-sufficiency and uh, combine those with the uh, private sector, the uh, philanthropic groups, the uh, private sector business group, the faith-based organizations to provide the kind of wraparound services that I was talking about with, with HUD VASH. And uh, it's been amazing, you know, as, as we've looked into this, the kinds of things that are available, for instance, uh, DOD, <coughs> Department of Defense, actually has a program where they will come into a multifamily uh, dwelling and teach the elderly people there child care. And they can actually get child care certification. So now, instead of looking at Andy Griffin all day, they can take care, I like Andy Griffin by the way, <laughs> um, they can take care of their three neighbors' children and their three neighbors are likely to be single moms. Uh, whose formal education ended with that first baby, who can now go back and get their GED, their associate's degree, their bachelor's degree, 
become independent, teach that to our children so we can break these cycles. If we don't break these cycles, which are unsustainable, we're doomed. So we, we have to use the brain that God gave us to start thinking into the future and what kind of things we have to do. And by the way, uh, you know, the system that exists right now, that elderly woman probably wouldn't want to do that because if her income goes up, her rent goes up. Uh, you know, we have these ridiculous things. We're in the process of disassembling all that. But I don't know who put that stuff together and what they were thinking. But anyway, um, we, we want to have systems in place that actually encourage people to make more money, that encourage people to get married, to bring someone else into the environment. You know, those, those are the kinds of things that work. You know, when it comes to poverty, there was a study done by the Brookings Institute on poverty. It was a broad ranging study. They concluded that there were three things that a person could do that would reduce their risk of living in poverty to 2% or less. Think about that. Number one, finish high school. Number two, get married. Number three, wait until you're married to have children. Now, what if we incorporated some of those ideals into some of the policies that encourage those kinds of things rather than discourage them? I think we'd see a lot less poverty going on. Indeed. If, so taking it a step further, and we're looking at the sort of infrastructure of housing, uh, the health issues related to housing, what role do you think both, well, community and social health workers and the uh, faith-based uh, leaders can play in helping to improve health? Well, I think they play a tremendous role uh, because, you know, particularly when we're looking at, at a lot of the elderly, um, you know, there was a time in our country when, you know, we took care of our parents, but that time seems to be uh, fading. And we have a lot of elderly people who, you know, thought that they would be able to take care of themselves. But, you know, people are living a long period of time now. You know, if you go back to the previous turn of the century, the average age of death was under 50. And now we're approaching 80. And, you know, there are a lot of things that we haven't done to adjust to that. That's a whole other conversation. But, uh, you know, people's 401ks until recently really weren't accumulating anything. So, you know, people find themselves in a position of being at an age where they probably should be thinking about retirement, but a financial situation that really doesn't let them do it. But eventually they have to go because they just, they're going to be so old they can't, you know, I, I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, that, by the way, is one of the reasons that we see so much Alzheimer's. People used to die before that time, but now, you know, they're, they're getting much older. But uh, one of the things these community work workers can do is help these people with the kinds of services that they need. And health workers, when you incorporate them into the communities so that people don't have to go somewhere, just bring them right there. I've visited a lot of places around the country that have nurse practitioners, that have PAs, that actually come in and do things for the elderly population there. They're much happier under those circumstances and can also facilitate their transportation when in fact that is necessary. Uh, those are the kinds of things that bring quality of life. Also, you know, we need to be thinking about how we build things appropriately so that people can share uh, I was recently uh, at an elderly development where you had your own bedroom, your own bathroom, but there was a common shared space. And this is very nice because it helps to facilitate the interactions mm -hmm. because what happens is people get isolated by themselves. And uh, you know, studies have shown that th those people are much more prone to dementia and things like that. So you know, we need to be thinking both in terms of, of what's healthy for them and what's convenient for them and what is economically feasible for us as a society. 
Well, thank you. We have time for one more question. So um, I'm, since I'm running the clock, I'm sort of, it's, we started the inning before the hour and a half went up. So okay. I'll get the question in. This is the Future of Health Summit. So let's take a look at 2025. What two, three changes or significant uh, improvements do you see being made between now and then that improves the health of individuals and communities, including their housing? Well, I think uh, one of the real key things here is a much greater emphasis on public-private partnerships uh, because there's a lot more money in the private sector than there is in the government. And uh, so what government needs to be working on is creating the win-win situations uh, so that you know, people can do well while at the same time being a positive influence on the society. Things like the opportunity zones, uh, which are coming up and looking at economically depressed areas and providing people with an opportunity with a long-term investment of their capital gains that haven't been realized to make even more money, but at the same time to help us to improve these uh, situations. Uh, you know, that is going to be absolutely key. If we can inculcate that into the way that we think, the way the government thinks, and the way the society thinks, I think we're going to be uh, much better off. Also, building holistic communities. Um, you know, I, I look at, for instance, East Lake uh, side of Atlanta. This was like the worst area in terms of poverty, crime, educational attainment, absolutely in the basement. And, uh, you know, they, they came in, uh, purpose planned communities, redid the whole community. Now they have grocery stores, uh, two charter schools, um, job training, a beautiful mixed income housing, a golf course. <laughs> it was pretty nice, I gotta admit. <laughs> and uh, you know, I went into the charter high school. I was met by five students playing the harp. And I was like, all the things that they have available to them, their schools are achieving at the highest level in the state better than the private schools. You know, these are things that we can do if we plan these communities out the right way. And there are more of them around the country. So, you know, that's the kind of thing. If, if we can stop fighting each other and, uh, you know, just, you know, that's, that, that's a whole other pet peeve of mine. You know, we got so much going on for us in this country. There's nobody who can take us down except ourselves. You know, we got to stop being so stupid and falling for this stuff. And, and just focus on our problems. You know, you can take the most radical left-wing person, the most radical right-wing person, probably 90% of stuff they agree on. But we allow people to take that 10% and exacerbate it and make it into something that that's all we can think about. That's craziness, that's idiocy. Somehow we've got to move away from that. And, uh, and if we begin to do that, focus on what our real problems are, I am convinced that collectively we have the wisdom and the know-how to get it done. Great. Well, thank you very much, Secretary. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.